In the 1930s, the linguist Benjamin Lee Whorf proposed what is now known as the Supir-Whorf hypothesis. Whorf, influenced by his mentor Edward Supir, theorized that the way we read, write, and speak could influence and even control the ways we think about the world, as well as our abilities and our behaviors. While the hypothesis has faced skepticism, it's been tested in numerous experiments over the years, and researchers have confirmed that our languages are sometimes associated with differing skill levels at certain tasks. One such example is telling apart colors. Our knowledge of the various colors might seem obvious, but some languages have no separate words for colors like blue and green. Instead, the same word is used for both colors, and this does affect people's ability to tell these colors apart. Speakers of the Zuni language consider orange and yellow to be the same, and they have a harder time telling apart shades of orange-yellow. The hypothesis is further supported by the directional skills of Australian Aboriginal speakers of the Kuktaiori language. In Kuktaiori, there are no terms for directions like left or right. Instead, this is described using north, south, east, and west. Therefore, speakers of the Kuktaiori must remain constantly aware of their own directional orientation in a way that English speakers are not. These people can tell which way they're facing at all times, even in unfamiliar buildings. Their language has required this since they learned to speak. Keith Chen, an economic professor at Yale, theorized that the influence of language could be even more far-reaching in its effects on our behavior. He recalled how, when talking about an uncle, the Chinese language requires speakers to specify their exact relationship, whereas the English language allows speakers to use the same word for any uncle. Unlike English speakers, the Chinese speakers would have to remember these precise differences. Chen suspected that certain features of languages could also shape how we think about and plan for the future. What if some of us had to remember the difference between the present and the future, but others didn't? This is an important distinction among many languages. Their grammar either requires us to tell the future apart from the present, or it doesn't. English is what's called a futured language. To talk about the future, we have to say, it will be cold tomorrow, rather than, it is cold today. We can't just say, it is cold tomorrow. But futureless languages like Finnish allow people to use constructions like, today be cold, or tomorrow be cold. They can say, be cold about the present or the future. Chen predicted that when a language treats the present and future as the same, we might start acting like the future is no different from the present and consider it to be just as important as the current moment. We might be willing to make trade-offs in the present for the benefit of our future. Conversely, if we see the future as something very separated and distant, we might be more inclined to disregard consequences. To test his theory, Chen gathered data from surveys spanning 76 developed and developing countries in five continents. He compared households with the same income, family structure, educational levels, and religious beliefs. They only differed in their language. His findings were astounding. Speakers of futured languages like English saved money only 69% as often as speakers of futureless languages like Finnish. The futureless speakers saw the future as equally important and valued saving up for the years ahead. Even when Chen controlled for a country's GDP, growth rates, interest rates, and unemployment, their language was the strongest predictor of saving or spending behavior and futured speakers ultimately had 39% fewer retirement assets. These effects also weren't just cultural or regional. In countries where people speak both kinds of languages, the difference still remained. In Switzerland, where three languages are spoken, futured speakers still save money only 36% as often as their futureless neighbors. And on a national scale, countries with futureless languages saved 6% more of their GDP yearly. These patterns even extended to healthy and unhealthy habits. Featured language speakers were less likely to use condoms or birth control, 24% more likely to smoke, and 29% less likely to be physically active. They were also 13% more likely to be obese, incurring a number of additional health risks. For them, the burden of responsibility today wasn't worth the benefit of a better future. The impact of their choice is very real. People over 60 who smoke are at an 83% higher risk of death. Even those who smoke and then quit are 34% more likely to die. And an inactive lifestyle can be just as deadly. 
one out of every 10 deaths in the world occurs due to being sedentary. Like many respondents who spoke a featured language, these amount to 5.7 million deaths every year, the unexpected effect of something as simple as language. Chen's research showed that even seemingly insignificant features of our languages can have a massive impact on our health, our national prosperity, and the very way we live and die. 